The central rule to be observed for a profitable study of philosophy is use your own judgment and reason under the guidance of your professor and textbook. The main cause that prompts men to philosophize, as Plato and Aristotle already pointed out, is wonder or admiration. The mind wonders as long as a given fact has not been given an explanation and assigned adequate causes. It endeavors to discover causes and principles so as to account for experience. Out of this desire, philosophy was born. In this desire, it finds its incentive. Hence, an essential quality of the mind is to be inquisitive, to question and to investigate, and never to feel at rest so long as a satisfactory explanation has not been found. It must compare facts, gather solutions, discuss, criticize, and harmonize them. The work of philosophy must be a personal work of understanding, not the mere memorizing of the words of the professor or of the books. It is true that without books or professors, the student could do very little. He would grope in the dark, uncertain of the direction to be taken and of the, and of the value of the progress already made. But nevertheless, these are only aids for the student's thinking, and their teaching would be of very little value if the mind did not verify it and appropriate it. If exaggerated self-confidence is a serious defect, if man must listen to the opinions of others, be somewhat diffident of his own intellect, and proceed cautiously, it is also a serious defect for the mind to remain inactive and to take for granted everything that is said without understanding the truth of it. A lesson in philosophy is not like a lesson in geography or history. When I am told that Peking is in China and London in England, I believe it at once. My activity consists only in memorizing a fact which I cannot verify and on which I'll agree. But in philosophy, it is always necessary first to understand and verify the truth of a statement. The work of memorizing comes last. Never try to memorize anything which is not understood thoroughly. A nurse is a help to the child who begins to walk. She guides his first steps, but cannot take the place of the child's own activity. The walking process must be that of the child. So also the beginner in philosophy needs guidance, but this can never dispense with his own activity. To be genuine and to deserve its name, philosophy must be the mind's own philosophy. Not in the sense that the mind has discovered all the truths with which it possesses, but in the sense that it has appropriated and digested them and thought them out for itself. Habits of reflection must be acquired. Man is not or should not be a machine to be moved at will by an engineer. He must act for himself. This is not a show of ready-made formulas, but rather a show of suggestions for the student's thought. The study of philosophy should make a man cautious in affirming or denying and approving and condemning the opinions of others. If those men are not to be admired and imitated, who are never able to make a resolution, to side for or against a proposition, and to give a straight answer, still less are those to be commended who have already, who have already made ideas on, on, on all questions, unchangeable and categorical solutions for all problems, and who no amount of proofs, however cogent, can never induce to modify their views. The most affirmative are also frequently the most ignorant.